Hi, everybody. Welcome to GW Center for Integrative Medicine uh, YouTube channel. Today, we have a very special podcast. I'll, I'll about to talk about this in a minute. Uh, I'm your co-host, Dr. Kogan, Medical Director of CIM, Associate Professor of Medicine at GW. So today, I have a super special privilege to have my New York mom with me. Uh, we, uh, we kind of became really close after we wrote the book together. So uh, Joan Lidman smith is uh, here with us today. I'm super excited. It's been quite a while. It's been many years since, well, actually two and a half years since the hardcover came out and the soft cover came out almost a year ago, back in March last year. So we kind of thought, let's get together, talk about where our lives is, talk about personal things, start, talk about aspirations for our next projects, um, and then just see where what's going on with cannabis. I have some updates for folks, and I'm sure, Joan, you have stuff to talk to. So how have you been? I, I'm i good. I miss working with you every day. That's Yeah, it's, yeah. It I was know, special I know, time. and you, you've grown up since we started working together, so... Um, uh, that's very true. I, uh, I I own you a great deal of improvement in my English. And you became a top doctor. So in DC, I'm very uh, well, proud of my my uh, my you. DC son. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you've been sort of trying to shelve in place, right? I mean, your your um, your husband is has some health issues, and you guys have been trying to survive the COVID successfully. Thank God. Yes. Um. It's I had it tough. twice. I had it twice. You gave me good advice on vitamins and what to take. So I always follow your advice. Mm -hmm. and, um, and aches and pains. I've been using topical THC and CBD, which uh, which works. So um, as always, Dr. Kogan is the one to listen to. Yeah, the, the one of the cases, I don't know if you're comfortable talking about it, I'll ask you anyway. One of the cases in the book was someone close to you. Unfortunately, she didn't do yes. so great. But I think cannabis did help your sister. At the yes, end, I mean, she, she passed away from breast cancer, but she used cannabis for nausea, she um, for pain. She never threw up once in extreme, um, you know, some nausea, taste issues, but it was it was really got her through. It's what got her through. Yeah. And unfortunately, my brother passed away from Parkinson's disease and lived in North Carolina which mm -hmm. still doesn't have medical marijuana legalized. Mm -hmm. And he kept wishing he could get a hold of it. So it's getting better. Misha, you know more about where it stands legally and the rest of the Yeah, country. yeah, yeah. We're going to talk about that in a couple of minutes. Yeah, but uh, yeah. So your your sister's case is in cancer chapter, chapter eight. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, let's talk a little bit about that. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had this major major development, right? So the FDA put a strong recommendation to DA and to the Biden's administration saying the cannabis should be rescheduled from schedule one, where it is now all the way to schedule three, which would equate it to things like ketamine, for example, for injections. Mm -hmm. And so it's a big deal because the FDA never took that stance before. Um, it's not a legal statement. The TA does not have a legal way to say, okay, we say this, so law changes. They just make recommendation. But still, it comes from FDA, Federal Drug Administration, from their own team saying that cannabis doesn't belong in Schedule 1 because it's relatively low side effect profile and very clear documented evidence. I find it kind of fascinating how they position that statement. They basically said something along the lines of, strong evidence for nausea, for vomiting, for uh, PTSD. They even mentioned, I think, insomnia. They didn't talk about pain. I don't find it fascinating. Sure. I think, yeah, I don't know why they didn't cross that because actually there's more data for pain than anything, but they've done their own analysis, you know, whatever. So that's one big thing. So it's possible that we will be seeing a final movements of, res of a federal national rescheduling, meaning that all of these patches of uh, law, laws in each state would sort of become semi-irrelevant because you'll be able to buy cannabis in any state from any other state and then move them across the lines of states because right now for Schedule 1, you can't do that. Uh, but it will be not so easy necessarily because it would means that physicians will be able to prescribe cannabis 
but then the, that whole process, how it will look, will be very unclear because there will have to be a federal regulation on how to handle this, right? Because if it's something that can be prescribed, so then it means there has to be a access in pharmacies. And there, so it, it, it will change everything um, yeah. for, for better or worse. I mean, I think definitely overall, it's a direct, move in the right direction. Interestingly- yeah. hmm? it do you think it depends on who's who's in the government, whether it's a Republican or Democratic government? Um, I was I, surprised to hear that Biden suddenly changed his opinion. He was very against uh, legalization. And suddenly, I think about I don't know, a few months back, he made an announcement that he asked the DA to make the statement. And also he asked uh, his legal team to sort of say, look into this and, and sort of start pushing. Um, I don't know what changed his opinion. I, I, I'm sure he has got smart people advising him. That's probably why. Um, it's definitely, I mean, I will it happen before the end of Biden's this term? I doubt because, you know, these things don't move overnight. Um, will it? It's we can actually. Only, we can only hope. We yeah. Can only... I'm not sure it will depend on whoever's going to be next president. You know, Trump. Trump moved CBD from unclear legal situation to the farm bill. So if Trump takes the next presidency, he's probably actually going to be supported. I think he, even though I don't know what the rest of Republicans can say, but this is a very bipartisan issue. It's not divided by the party lines. It's divided by some personal opinions. There are some both aisles, some senators who are against it for whatever reasons, but not because they're Republicans or Democrats. In fact, there's a lot of Republicans that are very pro legalization. Yeah, well, I like your optimism. That's um, <laughs> I'm well, I became more optimistic. If you'd ask me a while back, I'd say forget it, not worth discussing. Yeah. But something changed. I don't actually know what exactly changed. I, I, I have a feeling it's a combination of multiple factors. The fact that you know most states legally allowing this we have discussing this in the book very you you have a great chapter on that whole process and sort of history of it and of course now we're a couple of years outdated but um, yeah. you know that's still i think most of it is still stands right there have been only few new states added since 2021 or fall 2021 but there have been a lot of positive articles on the benefits so that you know media means something it ma media matters Right. And I think those articles are very helpful. And um, there, was, there was one of our article. Yes, you got, letter. Your letter. you got the letter <laughs> published in the Times. And that, That's of right. Course, um, That's good. Yeah, and that was about seniors, which I, I hope you talk more about because the benefits for older people is really, I think, one of the things that might drive the positive attitudes about cannabis. Um, well, I, I think that if we see the rescheduling, um, I'm probably going to be one of few people advocating nationally for the CMS inclusion so that Medicare pays for it. I think wow. the biggest current hurdle is not pros and cons. It's not side effects. It's, it's really the cost. It's the cost and logistics. And if we can simply write the order and send it to the pharmacy and patient goes to a pharmacy, you know, basically we're going back 200 years ago, right? Like 1850s, well, a little less than 200 years ago. 1850s, that's exactly what people used to do. The, the, the provider like me would write an order to the patient. Um, they go to the pharmacy and they buy some alcohol cannabis tincture. And we have in every presentation I ever make, there's photos of this yeah. Lily, Lily Wyeth and uh, whatever the pharmacies, whatever the big pharmaceutical company back at the time, they were all selling well, I think when they see the profits that some of these cannabis dispensaries are making, they're going to start thinking they should get in on the act. Well, so, they're already getting on it. I mean, you know, yeah. it's, it's it's pretty obvious that the, the big names like GW Pharmaceutical out of England, I mean, their products, Epidiolex, is the only legal cannabis extract in the U.S., right? The, the, the prescription cannabinoids, Marinol, that have been sold for a while, then some of them are generic already. Uh, but uh, epidiolex is nothing but pure CBD. Of course, we should have several companies instead of selling for $36,000 a year. It should be sold for $3,000. That would be a fair price for the pharmaceutical cost of the CBD on the free market. 
but the reality is that you know unfortunately you know it's it will take its own pace yeah uh, so i think one of the challenges is at least in new york where i live um there are all these pop-up stores that are selling cannabis they can they're not legal yet they're still they're selling um I don't know what they're selling. Uh, I think there are only four or five legal cannabis dispensaries and mm -hmm. people are getting very nervous that they might be, you know, mixed with fentanyl and other things like that. And it's turning people off, unfortunately, because the recreational marijuana market is seems to be so unregulated. And I'm afraid of well, that. Um, yeah. No, no, I, 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 I think you're hundred percent right. That's yeah. A problem. It's well, a problem. that's the, the hope is that once we see a federal regulation that all this dissipates because even the recreational market then should start getting eventually regulated similar to, to alcohol. Yeah. Um, well, this is actually what I forgot to mention. Um, the uh, This Doctors for Drug Regulation used to be called Dr Doctors for Cannabis Regulation, DFCR, that I uh, board of advisors on. Um, we put the letter right now, putting a letter right now to Biden saying, look, it's not just enough to say go from schedule one to schedule three. We should go from schedule one to no schedule at all because it's even safer than alcohol. And why is alcohol free without any anything? And, and why should cannabis be regulated? You know, so so the, the response to that from a lot of experts is you will actually see increase in some toxic effects you will see potentially products that are not quality enough. But I think the market can self-regulate. It, it actually is cheaper and easier to make a high quality products and sell them because there's a demand in the market than trying to make some counterfeit. And, you know, black market always creates all kinds of yeah. crazy problems. But when people could get something and they know it's safe and they know it's pure, they're going to go for it. I mean, there'll always be a black market, but exactly. yeah. yeah, I mean, you have the problem in DC with a lot of these pop-up stores that claim to have, um, you know, uh, DC is somehow, this has been around for a long time, right? So the, the, med the law, medical one was approved in 2010, then the recreational, I, I, I'm going to screw this one up. I think it was 2019, I want to say that they approved, uh, then it took a little while before they actually started selling recreational. DC regulates it reasonably well. I mean, it's a small city, so I, I think the reality is the quality of products here in our area is very good. At least I have not seen any real concerns. I'm seeing way more concerns people buying stuff on the internet that oh. has something Delta 8. Um, in the new version, right? In the soft yes, cover, we talk, about it. Yeah. we talk about the Delta 8. Now, when we finished writing the updated version, it got published, the soft cover got published in March last year, but we were working on this for you know some months prior to that. And at that time, we've already been seeing a lot of problems with toxicity of Delta 8. I know it's like there's toxins in preparation because they have to extract it from hemp and they end up extracting down the toxins. And I've seen it on some complications of that in my own clinic. So we'll talk about this a little bit. Um, so I think that's a much bigger problem than, um, and, and those problems are going to go away. If we have a way of getting people high quality THC, you know, that is federally regulated and then federal regulation is, is, is guaranteed by the states so they can monitor the quality, all this federal problem, all this national problems with Delta 8 and all this other variants, they're just, they're just going to go out of business because they're not going to be able to compete. Yeah, um, yeah. And I, I think most people don't know about Delta 8. I mean, I think, right. you know, certainly the average person might go into a dispensary and, you know, just get THC, CBD. They don't even know the difference between CBD and THC. Many you know? people don't. Yep. I yep. mean, they, yep. you know, my friends say, oh, you know, they're selling cannabis. I said, well, what, what do you mean by cannabis? What, what, <laughs> is it CBD? Is it THC? Is it both? I, I don't know. I don't know. I said, well, read my book, read our book, and then you'll know. Um, but there's there's certainly a lot of a lot so, of so so let me ask you this, because for both of us, we talk a little bit about this in an opening, and, and anybody who got an audible, uh, you should have heard like our intro that we recorded, <laughs> right? Uh, but you know, you 
you had more experience with cannabis compared to me. When I came to U.S., my only way of looking at cannabis was it's a sort of a death sentence if you smoke once. That's what we've right. been told back in Russia. You know, you smoke cannabis one, and then it's a path of prostitution, drugs, and early early mortality. So we completely brainwashed back then. Uh, they actually look at this the same way. Look at the um, grinders, Brittany Grinders case. That was crazy. Uh, anyway, but um, you grew up in this country. You've seen the keeping movement. I smoke pot. I, you know, my friends all smoke pot. <laughs> my husband didn't like it and still doesn't. He's hesitant. He says he turns green and gets nauseated, whatever. Interesting. Um, <laughs> but he should, but um, it was just something we all did. And and if anyone reads our book, they'll see that there was an, we had big arguments about the, the word marijuana. That's right. Misha was very opposed to, and maybe still is opposed to, but that's no, what I. No, <laughs> you you <laughs> convinced me. You convinced me to to be comfortable. Well, not just you, but I think what convinced me more was just the the history of the entire shenanigans of the arrests and it's, persecution yeah. of minorities. Yeah, it, it's really. Uh, but anyway, you know, it's what my contemporaries and even. My daughter, who's considerably younger, they, they talk, they call it, you know, weed pop of marijuana. And in fact, cannabis is such a confusing word. As I say, my friends say, oh, I have cannabis. And I say, well, what is it? And they don't know the difference. At least marijuana is THC. It has some THC in it. So that's a little clearer. Right. Um, but, you know, it was, it was, I, I worked and I talk in the book about this, that I worked at the Narcotic Addiction Control Commission. Mm -hmm. And marijuana was never an issue that we were concerned about. It wasn't, you know, we all smoke pot, <laughs> everyone that worked there. It just wasn't a big issue. And, mm -hmm. you know, it became, if you read the historical section of our book, it just became a way that Nixon and the, you know, the government wanted to control minorities, but hippies, because hippies were radical. And, and that's what it was. It was a political decision to make it an evil drug. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but. Um, of it, course, now, of course, now that it's the one of the most profitable industries, of course, now, you know, blacks are still having a really hard time getting into that industry because now the money is in there. So it's, I just find the whole thing so disgusting, <laughs> like how it was used against, you know, one population and yeah. Whites kept using cannabis even in the most I mean, prohibited times. Every, you know, my friends were all smoking pot, and then exactly. minorities started getting arrested. Yeah. And the um the dis I you you probably know about this. Or I don't know if they do it in D.C., but the legal dispensaries in New York are all supposed to be in minority neighborhoods where people were mostly affected by it. Mm -hmm. So I think you know I don't know how it's working out. Um, actually. It seems like a lot of them are in the village, and the village is not exactly a big minority neighborhood. <laughs> so I don't. Well, I, I don't really, you know. I mean, I, I think I, that I happen to know that. So some of my mentors back from my time in Montefiore, so uh, Julie Arnstein and uh, Shinaza Cunningham, uh, they were my attendings at Montefiore, and they went into a research on this topic. And actually, Shinazo is now, I think, the health commissioner for New York State. Mm -hmm. And so they've pushed some of this, you know, regulation. So New York is actually very uh, uh, innovative in that they, they made that statement. They said, look, yeah. because of the politics of all this crap, we want to make sure that now there are some compensation, so to speak. So now that there's enough financial opportunities for minority populations to, you know, open their own dispensaries and serve their own communities. I don't know if it's actually practically happening, but I do know that there has been, um, so I'm kind of proud to call them my mentors because back when I was a I, beginning I, doctor, they were teaching. I think it's I think it's a great idea. I mean, people's lives were destroyed. I mean, totally destroyed for, I mean, a tiny bit. I, I It just, and it still goes on. I mean, it still it, goes on. Yeah. Our own coaching clinic, he had a run into legal for, for really nothing. Yeah. The type of possession that nobody. 
you know, it's still, and he's not, you know, he's a minority. So, so, you know, we, we have a situation still, I think there's still so much injustice and you know, persecution happening. Well, you know, Trump talks about the immigrants bringing in illegal drugs and blah, 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 right. blah, blah, and, you know, it just, it sounds like Nixon all over again, it really. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if he actually means cannabis. I actually think that, that if he gets elected, then the cannabis is going to be not looked upon badly. I think he's well, there has a stand on immigrants, but. Yeah, yeah but, yeah. you know, there's the evangelical movement. I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, <laughs> we, we don't talk on politics no, we won't talk. <laughs> <laughs> no but my point my point being is i think it is bipartisan issue so i i think we but, are cannabis I mean, is a bright future right but i think the wheels of justice turn very slowly and exactly any federal law like that just yeah. it, it it's but it'll happen i think in your children's lifetime <laughs> that's yeah it, talking about my children it's funny because you know we use cannabis in all kinds of forms at home, mostly topical actually, but you know, yeah. like like Angela Fine, my wife found that you know, CBG gummies from Healer C B D works really good for her sleep. So so she's been taking that. And you know, kids seeing this and, and for them it's like just a normal. Um so I, I talk to them periodically about so you know everybody smokes pot at their school. I'm like, so you guys your doctor your dad is all about medical cannabis. And they're like, yeah, well, you know, whatever. Like, we don't care. They don't smoke. They don't yeah. take cannabis. They're just like, they don't, they're not interested in it. And um, they well, see some consequences of some of their friends in the school. Uh, and in and the book, like you, make, you make a strong point about the yeah. growing brain. And it's not something exactly. we don't advocate it for adolescents unless it's, you know, for epilepsy or some, you know, cancer related pain. Um, and I think people have to keep that in mind. But like alcohol, you need to be a certain age. I think it's 21 in most states. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's the same thing with marijuana, with cannabis, with just there's got to be age limits where it's safe. Don't drive when you take it. I mean, reasonable. Common research. sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, things but, things you, know, you wouldn't do on alcohol shouldn't do on campus but but the, this it's still annoying at least for me i mean here you know we wrote this book together it's out in paperback i still can't get medical cannabis unless you come and visit me um <laughs> but uh, i don't have a new york license that's cool. yeah so i have to you know pay a couple hundred dollars for a, a medical marijuana doctor and i'm a little hesitant to do that but i guess i should bite the bullet and do that um well unless you know, feds move on this whole topic. Yeah, I'll be dead by then. You know. I don't know. I think you should be a little more more I don't optimistic. Know. But I, you know, I mean, I've I've gotten stuff. I've gotten stuff from the you know the recreational. I've gotten mm -hmm. topicals, which I mostly use. But there are, yeah. you know, it, it, I think I could get better quality things from medical marijuana dispensary. And also, um, I be I have to when the winter comes down a bit, the weather's better to go down to these dispensaries and put flyers. My neighbors, my friends have put flyers of our book out in dispensaries. Mm -hmm. So, um, and they, they disappear like crazy. Um, even the illegal ones, they want, they want my flyers, our flyers. So that's good. I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, so I, I think the book is still selling. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm kind yeah. of keeping an eye and um, I get, I just got another invite to give a brand rounds and, you know, this one is going to be at the end of a month. It's going to be palliative grand rounds of a large hospital system. And, well, I, I think your your efforts to educate doctors and medical students is really important. I mean, I I just, I really commend you on that. And the more you could do that, the better, because I, I think the public knows more about it than doctors. <laughs> yeah, true. that's, well, you know, you always say this is why we wrote the book, because we felt like the book is, should be read by equally by physicians and by public. And I bring, every time I have a doctor's appointment, God knows I have way too many. I bring a guy, my latest, my mammogram, I can write yeah. to the doctor, here's a, you know, I autograph it for them, and they're yeah. like, wow, this is, and yeah. the doctor I went to, she was limping, she hurt her knee, and I said, oh, this is perfect for you, you have to read the section. 
on pain and topicals and she was so <laughs> grateful. <laughs> so, I love it. I love yeah, it. Yeah. And you know, my my rheumatologists, they all have copies and yeah. <laughs> display it in your offices. So it's yeah, there like are always always here. Um so yeah, so regarding education, we're finishing this project that I, I think we mentioned it in the book that we were starting to work on these competencies for for um, yeah. medical education and for the U.S. and Canada, like for national right. competencies. Right now, there are a lot of courses. There are a lot of different ways people, physicians can or or any providers can learn about cannabis. But it's not kind of sanctioned by the whole system. It's sanctioned by some local institutions on a very random basis. Like for example, we have a great teaching program at the University of Maryland, just my own backyard, you know, forty minutes right. from here. But but you know, you look around at places like my own institution, UW, and there's absolutely nothing. Um, in fact, I give a couple of lectures here and there, but it's very like spontaneously and random in a sense, but there's nothing formal. So we're finishing up this process where we have uh, 20 plus experts. Um, some of them are, I'm, I'm not going to use the names because we're still in the process of finishing the research, but some of this like really top people in research and clinical arena in medical cannabis and, um, you know, we're basically saying every school in the country, medical school to start with, must teach this, this core topics. And so we worked on what those core topics are, and we're going to get this out into publication, hopefully within 12 months, maybe sooner, actually, hopefully within six months, so that we actually start going to American um, College of Medical American Association of Medical Colleges and say, look, you have to adopt this as a required. Uh, and if it, it, once they adopt it as a standard set of competencies, then the entire country and Canada are going to have to follow this as a sort of like a standard of education. Um, so that's a big kind of goal, I think. I don't know how far we will get. The process itself is almost finished. Um, we're, going, we're already working on a paper. We're kind of slowly moving forward. Um, and this is kind of a consortium of all kinds of centers, but the driving force is, you know, me from GW. We have two colleagues from Israel, from Ben Gurion University, and then Leslie Mendoza Temple is from the University of Chicago in Illinois. So we're kind of international here. Um, and well, Israel has been using oh, federal, see. yeah. So we included uh, folks from there just because there's a lot of history there and, and they've helped us quite tremendously with all kinds of historic information and also terms of understanding how it's uh, nationally legalized and taught in Israel. And by the way, it's not great either. <laughs> their teaching their providers there is, is not any better than here. If they have really? some poor quality course that's designed for the whole country, but medical students are not required to learn anything until after. So they, they have their own mess, just like everybody else. You know, I, I think, unfortunately, the way to probably get to medical schools to get them to adopt this is to talk about the side effects, because all they care about is bad stuff. And yeah, you're going to get not... young kids come in, overdosing, blah, blah, blah. That might be a way to get in and then talk about the positive things, because, right. you know, it's all about problems, you know problems that could bring patients in and bring money in and that's what they want there's i mean i might be a little cynical but i think no but you're absolutely right I, I think that's how medicine is practiced in this country yeah. you know it yeah. is a for-profit there isn't a need you know the need is going to be people are going to you know anyway it's it's um well the can cannabis industry is scary for the entire healthcare industry because yeah. <laughs> we know that it's an exit drug right we know that once people go on cannabis they often get off of opioids and benzodiazepines and antidepressants and anti-anxiety drugs and all kinds of drugs. And so that's less money into the pharma, into the, you know, physicians' pockets. And yes, but once it becomes, they get rid of the scheduling. Right. You have it in your local pharmacy, well, they'll make the money. It's, <laughs> it's a win-win situation. It's well, right let's, let's hope that this are the words of the future. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm glad you came around to accepting the word marijuana. That's um, yeah. Um, I it's still I I think part of the hesitancy. I can't say it very well. It's a lot easier for me to say word cannabis. So for yeah. me personally, that's just an easier word to use. That's 
It's okay. Yeah. I brainwashed you. That's uh, yeah. You did. You did. So what's uh, what are you working on now? Um. Well, I'm doing. <laughs> I'm editing. Doing a lot of editing. Um. I'm always looking for letters to write to the editor for us to promote the book. I'm trying to promote the book. Uh, I think Sweeney wants to have you do another talk, which would be okay. good. Um, yeah, I'm editing a lot of memoir, doctor's memoirs, um, sociologist memoirs. Um, that's, you know, basically it. Um, I, I don't know about another book. I mean, I, I always would love to write a book with you, but we have to have a book. Yeah, um, we have to have a book. Yeah, yeah. We I have a book on aging, which was supposed to be finished. Well, actually, well, it is finished. But it got bumped, so Oxford canceled the book. So oh, now I have no idea what we're gonna do with it. It's just sitting yeah. there. But we have to I mean, for, for popular, I mean, I, I mean, I'm happy to help you with any academic books, but my specialty is popular books. Yeah. And you know, aging. There are a million books. You know, it's a wonderful topic today. In the Times, there was another article about mm -hmm. aging, the science section. Um, it's uh, you know, everyone's fascinated with it and but you know another book on it i don't know another book on age maybe uh know. maybe we'll write a book on long COVID. Like, well i was gonna i was gonna ask you about that yeah um, well i i talked to chris she didn't feel the time is yet there she felt like because there's so many much uncertainty that um it's not a forum topic yet i kind of disagree with that um but that was her opinion chris is our agent yeah. Um, but you know, we could still pitch in the topic to somebody else. So, yeah. Well, I, I think I mean I, I think the way to go is to write about it. And very often when you write about a topic, mm -hmm. publishers and agents might pick up on it and say you want to do mm -hmm. a book about this. Mm -hmm. Um I mean that's I I don't, you know, a whole book on I I, I think, you know, writing about long COVID is useful mm -hmm. um may i mean i i don't know well i, I always seeing is a tremendous struggle i mean we have a long list of patients um and it seems like you know the statistics are earlier in the disease um like so, say two years ago in 2022 we had uh, up to about 10 to 15 percent of all the patients becoming long COVID patients. It's gotten a lot better in the last year, year and a half. So now with that percentage maybe down to under five. But think of it this way: if everybody had a COVID once, and then five percent of the entire population now has long COVID, I mean, we're talking about massive numbers. That, right. that basically is a new disease that's going to be with us for for decades going forward. Somebody has to come up with formal process forward for this patient and treatment. And there's well, a lot just, of controversial. Yeah, there, um, just before the podcast, I was reading MedPage, had a whole interview, a whole thing on long COVID, mm -hmm. and some of the various theories and anticoagulants and, you know, Paxlovid. I mean, there, but it's it's such a changing field. It's not. I it's, think that's what the Chris meant. That's what Chris meant. Yeah. I, I think she meant that because it's such a rapidly changing field, by the time we finish writing book, it has to get rewritten. It's and, not. Yeah. Yeah. That's the problem. So it's hard to say where that will end up in, a, say, a year from now and what kind of tools will be. Used. Is there a place for cannabis? with long Oh, long? yes. Oh, yes. So that's. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, I, that's why I think if you want to, if we do or you do articles or letters to the Times or to Washington Post again, mention the book. I mean, I, I think the more we could promote, not for sales purposes, right. but the good of society, um, if people read our book and understand, you know, what cannabis is, you know, the whole history of why it got banned. Um, I think we're doing a good thing for society. And um, I really haven't seen much about cannabis and long COVID. So it, it's a it's a good opportunity. Mm. Maybe that's what maybe that's what your podcast should be for Sweeney. That's not a bad idea. But we have to we'll discuss mm. that. <laughs> we'll discuss Let me let me sit on this, how to position this, because I can also talk to some of my friends, you know, Dustin Sulak and, you know, 
Trish Fry and some other people, and just just to see, um, there may be a topic here, like a whole topic, you know, right. that needs to be discussed and presented and taught to our own colleagues. Um, I mean, you know, because the long COVID, long COVID gives people chronic fatigue and insomnia and depression, anxiety. You know, this what we call an autonomic instability or POTS, posture or prostatic hypertension, when people kind of shift position and blood pressure drops quite a lot and they get like, you know, they have a hard time walking and they're short of breath because of that. So, you know, the cannabis can can do lots of things. It can regulate nervous system, it can help with sleep and can decrease any pain syndromes that are associated with long COVID. Those, there's multiple, not just one or two, but many. So, yeah. Well, I wrote to you about my friend and her daughter, both who have long COVID. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And she she just got COVID again. I got, I had lunch with her and she told me the next day she got COVID. So I was sort of isolating for a, a week, but luckily I didn't get it because I take all the precautions you tell me. <laughs> Lots of the fun things. Maybe, maybe if we ever do an updated version of it that could be a whole new chapter in the book. oh yeah no i i think but i think it's worth i mean the thing about these talks like sweeney talks is, is that you're talking to science writers and medical writers and then they do articles mm -hmm. and the more people learn about this the better you know i'm very big on publicity and mm -hmm. it's and i think um besides as i say it's always good to self book but to get the knowledge out there is really really important um so you know i you got to do another podcast I, you you decide the topic and i'll pitch it we'll do it we'll have to think of something more specific i just wanted us to get together it's a new new year um we haven't presented anything didn't talk about this publicly so i think this was this yeah, was good no, was i mean this, this is terrific and i'm always up to collaborating with you uh it, well, I'll I'll let you go. I'm gonna say thank you, and um, we'll uh, we'll. You'll have we'll, to come to New York. Yeah, I'll have to come to New York. I'll have to <laughs> see you guys there. Yeah. So thank you everybody for watching. Uh, if you like what you saw today, please subscribe um, to our channel, and uh, we'll stay we'll stay in touch. We'll uh, post a lot more videos on all kinds of topics that are important in health particularly in integrative medicine, holistic care, and anything to keep you healthy and live a long life. Thanks, yes. everybody. And you look younger by the day, Misha. So uh, I... <laughs> all right. Uh, thanks, I'm... everybody. Again, this is John Lieben Smith, my co-author of our book, Medical Marijuana. I learned how to say that word right. Very good. Excellent. And, and you, uh, you've become a terrific writer, I have to say. Uh, um, no, no, you, you too. You barely, you know. barely need my help anymore. <laughs> no, that's not true. <laughs> okay. Thanks, on everybody. Next, on to the next On to project. the next project. Okay. Bye.